Greetings and love to all of you. It's such a deep joy to be with you all for our world convocation. And in the love of God and the gurus, I bow to you. Such a wonderful world family that we have. Well, today we have a wonderful subject, how to make selfless, selflessness and sharing a part of your daily life. And earlier this year, when we were planning the convocation, we reached out to a number of devotees and we asked them, what subjects would you like to see covered in the classes? And one of the common requests was for this subject of selflessness. Devotees see the selfishness, the me first consciousness that's so rampant in the world today, and they're naturally concerned. And so they want to know, what can I do? So today, what we're going to show you is regardless of what the world's going through. With Guruji's teachings, you can create a beautiful life for yourself, filled with caring for others that brings you much fulfillment, where you really feel and know that you are helping to build a better world. So the first question, why is selflessness so important? Intuitively, we know it's good to be generous and kind and sharing, to think of others. But so often when we're under pressure, when we're facing lots of challenges, it's so easy, isn't it, to become self-absorbed, where we're spending much of our time thinking about ourselves, our problems, my needs, my this, my that. Why is Selflessness so important because it's part of who we are and how we are created. I'd like to read an affirmation given by Gurudev Paramahansa Yogananda. You may wish to close your eyes while you listen to this and really try to feel the deep power of these words. My heavenly Father, thou art love, and I am made in thine image. I am the cosmic sphere of love, in which I behold all planets, all stars, all beings, all creation, as glimmering lights. I am the love that illumines the whole universe. This isn't just a poetic inspiration. This is a profound cosmic truth. This is the cosmic reality. As the soul, we are part of the infinite consciousness of God. And the essence of that consciousness is peace, kindness, consideration, wisdom, joy, and love. I am the love that illumines the whole universe. Now, when you take infinite consciousness, which we are, and you restrict it, confine it to little, narrow thoughts of self-centeredness, thinking all the time, me, 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 it does not work. The soul rebels and we experience distress within. We become very unhappy. And that's why you'll never find a saint who is self-centered. And you'll never find someone who is self-centered who is happy. Metaphysically, that's not possible. We are built to care for others, to love one another. It's part of our spiritual DNA. Now, you look at the world today, the chaos, the unrest, 
the divisiveness, one of the root causes, too much selfishness. People are thinking too much of themselves. This causes distress in the individual. This causes unhappiness and distress in societies. And this causes unrest, unhappiness, suffering in nations. Because selfishness, it's a basic violation of who and what we are. I'd like to read some words of Guruji, Paramahansa Yogananda. The evolution of even the most materially dynamic person is inconsiderable so long as he or she remains hidebound in self-centered concerns. Selfishness is a clamshell existence. Tightly enclosing a soul in one body and one personality. Some people are so limited to their physical form and its sensations that they are little, if ever, aware of the feelings of others. And then he continues. Unselfishness and generosity make a person cognizant of the souls of others. To serve others by identifying their necessities as one's own and providing whatever one can in the way of material needs, psychological succor, or spiritual enlightenment is wondrously expansive, uniting one's consciousness with the lives and hearts of others. So two points here. Selfishness is a clamshell existence. How would you like to live your entire life shut up in a clam? It wouldn't be much fun, very dark and confining. But isn't that what millions are doing? Because think, what are we? Infinite consciousness of God. And yet you look at the selfish people, uh, selfish way people are living, clam-like. So we have to break out of that shell, clam of selfishness. And then the second point, to serve others, to help them in whatever way we can, is wondrously expansive. When I was a young monk in training, there was a wonderful saintly monk in charge of us new monks. His name was Brother Premamoy. We revered him. And sometimes in the group of new monks, some misunderstanding would arise. This is normal when you have a group of people living and working together in very tightly tight quarters. And Brother Premamoy was very intuitive, and he would invariably catch wind of it. And so he would talk to us at the breakfast table, and he would say, why are we here? We're here for cosmic consciousness, aren't we? Do you know what that means? And then he would continue, it means to feel oneness with all life, with every human being. And then he would tell us, so, you say you want cosmic consciousness and you can't even respect and understand one of your brothers? And we'd all kind of inwardly hang our heads and make that strong determination to try to do better, to become a better devotee, a, a better disciple of these teachings. In lesson 50, of the self-realization lessons, our guru talks about three ways to cosmic consciousness. And you don't choose just one way. You have to embrace and follow all three. So first of all, there's the metaphysical way. This is using the science of Kriya Yoga, the sacred meditation techniques our guru gives to attain direct personal transcendental experience of God. And then there's the way of discipline. 
This is using the discrimination, the wisdom faculty of the soul, to observe yourself and identify those desires, those actions that in the long run you see are detrimental, that will pull you away from God, and then using your willpower to renounce them and to put your energies and attention behind noble and good actions and desires. So the way of discipline, of self-control. And then the final way Guruji mentions is the social way. And that's our subject today. Here's what he says. The social way consists in expanding the germ of divine love within the soul. Too much love of self confines the soul to the ego boundaries of the flesh. It is when the ego begins to feel itself in other bodies through practical sympathy that it begins to regain its forgotten omnipresence. And all of these ways are interconnected. When we meditate deeply with an open, loving heart that really opens that channel wide through which we can receive God's response. And feeling that God within, it becomes much easier to recognize and appreciate that same beloved God as that divine presence expresses through those who come into contact with us, we come into contact with in our lives. And when outside of meditation, we're making a conscious effort to give love, to give caring, to have an open heart with others, then at the end of the day, when it's time to sit on our meditation seat, it's going to be much easier to meditate with an open, loving heart towards God because we've been practicing it all day long with others. So deep meditation helps us to be more caring and loving. And trying to be more caring and loving outside of meditation deepens meditation. It's really two sides of the same coin. It's the expression of love in the stillness of meditation and the expression of love during our day's activities. Both expressions of the infinite love of which we are part. So now we're going to practice an affirmation together briefly. I'd like you to close your eyes, put your gaze, the point between the eyebrows, Concentrate, put your attention at the heart center, and really try to feel the words, the truth, the power of these words as we affirm them. Heavenly Father, thou art love, and I am made in thine image. I am the cosmic sphere of love in which I behold all planets, all stars, all beings, all creation. I am the love that illumines the whole universe. I am the love that illumines the whole universe. Paramahansa Yogananda, whom many of us call master and consider our guru, we call him master, he was master of himself. And we consider him the perfect example he was certainly the perfect yogi, the consummate yogi. He had such mastery over the life forces and energies that he could sit and in an instant go into samadhi 
cosmic consciousness. But we also consider him the perfect example of how to live and behave in this world. And one outstanding trait of our guru, he deeply, deeply cared about people. There's a story. There was a woman who lived in the Mount Washington neighborhood in the 1940s. A few, she lived a few blocks away from our international headquarters. And she went around the neighborhood at one point selling this little calendar she had made to raise funds for the local school. And so she came to our international headquarters, which we call the Mother Center, to sell her calendar. And she was received by Paramahansa Yoganandaji our guru. And she said he took a very kindly interest in her project, and she was utterly captivated by him. And he spent over two and a half hours with her. Now, she wasn't a devotee. She wasn't interested in our teaching. She came to sell her calendar. And mind you, Master had no free time. He had zero free time between the demands of the work, working on his writings, training the disciples, going to the temples, uh, meeting all the different organizational demands of the work. He had absolutely no free time. And yet here it is. This neighbor, a stranger, walks in off the streets, and he spends over two hours with her. Diamata, who served with Guruji as his personal secretary for over 20 years, said this, Master had such a deep interest in every human being who crossed his path. He took time with people. And I confess, it sometimes caused concern among those of us who scheduled his appointments. But he never made people feel he was in a hurry. He was willing to give them all the t attention they seemed to need. Ingrained in his nature was a deep sense of wanting to serve people, to alleviate whatever problem or suffering they were going through. I remember Diamant talking to the monks and nuns once, and this was many years later when she was serving as the SRF president. And she told us something I always remembered. She said, the distinguishing mark of a monk or nun who has taken their final, final vows is this. Whoever comes to you will leave you uplifted. And she emphasized that you yourself may be going through personal struggles. Still, you will do your utmost to uplift those who come to you. And this applies to all of us, isn't it? Not just monks and nuns. You know, yes, the, the world's worrisome. Yes, the world's a, a troublesome place to be. But you know, there's different ways of looking at it. And you have to look at this whole thing in the right way. This world gives us so much opportunity to do good. And you don't have to build a hospital to do good. It's the little things giving someone a little of your time, a little of your understanding, giving someone some encouraging words, even a, a bright, loving smile. These things seem little, but when you do them day after day, week after week, year after year, the overall impact, it's not little. It's significant. It's significant. Once, I received a telephone call from a man, and he told me during the war, now I'm not sure if he was talking about World War II or the Korean War, which came a little later, but it was wartime, and he was in the Navy. He was a young sailor, and he was stationed in San Diego, which in America is one of the big Navy ports. And so he and a buddy, another sailor, heard that there was this little cafe up the coast in Encinitas that served mushroom burgers, and they heard that if you were in the armed forces, they would feed you for free. They'd give you a free meal. 
So they decided they wanted to try it out, and they hitchhiked up the coast, the coast highway, and they went into the little cafe in Encinitas, and they were enjoying their free mushroom burgers. This was the cafe that our guru started uh, serving vegetarian food, and it was well known for their mushroom burgers. At the time, in those years, vegetarian food wasn't common at all. So these two sailors were enjoying this, their free meals, courtesy of Guruji. And then this nicely dressed gentleman walked into the dining room, and he saw them, and he walked over to them, and he engaged them. He asked them how they were doing, and he sat down and asked them all about their lives. And this man told me they just had a wonderful, wonderful uh, time with this gentleman. And he spent about 30, 40 minutes with them, and then it was time for them to leave. Well. Many years, probably about 20 years after that, this man became a student of the SRF teachings. And one day, he was going through one of the magazines we publish, Self-Realization Magazine, and he saw a photograph of that man who had come in where they had had such the wonderful time with. It was Rajasi, Rajasi Janakananda. We think of Rajasi as, you know, the great disciple of our guru, the great yogi who would sit all day in samadhi meditation, not moving an inch, or when he wasn't meditating, just be, being very quiet, absorbed in that great bliss within. And yet here it is. He walks into the cafe, sees these two young sailor boys, probably no more than 18, 19 years old, and he goes over and engages them. He gives them his attention. He gives them his loving care. He makes them feel welcome. Gives them an experience they never forgot. Guruji said, consider no one a stranger. Learn to feel that everybody is akin to you. So I have another affirmation for us to practice. So please close your eyes, put your gaze at the Christ Center, and feel in your heart as we repeat these words of Guruji's. I will feel for others as I feel for myself. I will work out my own salvation by serving my fellow man. I will feel for others as I feel for myself. I will feel for others as I feel for myself. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the gunas and how they impact us as we go through the journey of life. And the gunas, these are the three attributes, our forces in cosmic nature. There's sattva, which is the elevating quality that influences us to do good and noble things, to live a virtuous life that draws us closer to God. There's the opposing darkening force of tamas, which pulls us to our bad habits, wrong decisions, evil actions keeping us in delusion. And then there's rajas. Rajas is the tendency to become involved in the constant busyness and activity of the world and to become entrapped in the desires and the attachments, likes and dislikes that are created by our engagement in all that activity. Now, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna speaks about three types of gift giving. There's the tamasic gift. This is a gift that is given without any goodwill for the recipient and often contempt. And an example of a tamasic gift would be a bribe. And I don't think 
many of us here are giving to Masik gifts. I know we aren't. And then there's the Rajasic gift. This is when you give something or you do something for someone, but there's an expectation that in return you're going to receive some benefit. So, for example, someone gives a large donation to a university with the stipulation that a building be named after them. Now, it's not bad. It's good to give donations to universities and hospitals and temples, but it's not a pure gift. It's not unconditional. There's strings attached. And then finally, there's the sattvic gift. That's where you give solely for the joy of giving as an expression of that infinite love of your soul. And you couldn't even think of receiving anything in return. It's not even on your radar. It's not even in the consciousness. You give because you give, because it's joyous to give. As we go through life, as much as we can, we want to strive to give to love in the sattvic way. And when you have difficulty in marriage, in any relationship, a very good question to ask yourself, how am I loving? Am I loving in the sattvic way or am I loving in the rajasic way? Because sure, there in a marriage and a relationship, there needs to be open discussion. We need to be honest. And there's certainly times when there needs to be compromise from both parties. But if we're not careful, what can sometimes happen is the prevalent attitude can be, well, I did this for you, so now you have to do that for me. Are, you didn't do that for me, so I'm not going to do this for you. I'm going to withhold this from you. And if that becomes the dominant theme, in other words, if both partners are acting in a way that's self-centered, it puts tremendous strain on the relationship, and that relationship becomes very difficult. But on the other hand, if both are acting in the sattvic way, doing for the joy of making the, others making the other one happy, then it becomes a very beautiful, fulfilling, ennobling relationship. Some years back, when I was the minister at Encinitas Temple, one of the ministers there, we had a devotee, and uh, an older devotee, much loved by everyone, and she passed away a few years ago. And I remember one Sunday in particular, she came running up to me. She was 89 years old at the time, but in her excitement, she was like a little girl. And she said, brother, brother, I have to tell you, my husband and I just celebrated our 59th wedding anniversary, and we're still deeply in love. And I said, that's beautiful. That's just so beautiful. And I said to her, what's your secret? Tell me what your secret is. And she said, we always try to make the other one happy. And whatever he does, I, oh, I'm just so grateful. And so there you have it, the sattvic way. We always try to make the other one happy. And the result, 89 years old, 59 years of marriage, still deeply, deeply in love. This principle of sattvic love very much applies to our relationship with God. One man wrote to us, and he said, I just want to tell you this Kriya Yoga doesn't work for me. I've practiced 1,800 times and nothing's happened. It's not working. Well, with that attitude, how do I say this? You can practice 18 million, 18 billion Kriyas and nothing's going to happen. You can't 
force God to come to you like that. It doesn't work that way. But when you practice your Kriya Yoga sincerely, with the unconditional love of your heart, then you create this magnet of divine yearning, of divine loving that becomes absolutely irresistible to God, and then he has to come to you. Speaking of the sattvic way, Guruji says this, the habit of giving gradually breaks down the walls of separation between God and man and leads the devotee to offer to the Lord the ultimate gift, the surrender of his soul. When he makes a gift of his soul to God through love, without any expectation of any return of divine favor, he has passed life's highest test. Brother Lawrence, the French monk and mystic who's well known for his little book, Practicing the Presence of God, he went through a rather difficult time, lasted four years, a dark night of the soul, where he thought it was quite possible during that time that he was doomed to eternal damnation. And yet he wrote to a friend of that period in his life, and this is what he said. I engaged in a religious life only for the love of God, and I have endeavored to act only for him. Whatever becomes of me, whether I be lost or saved, I will always continue to act purely for love of God. I shall have this good at least, that till death I shall have done all that is in me to love him. Complete forgetfulness of self, offering all that you are, all that you ever hope to be at the feet of beloved God in complete trust, in total surrender. You know, we, we talk about it being important to be selfless in giving to others. Well, one of the main reasons it prepares us, it prepares us to give ourselves to God. And when we can give ourselves to God completely in totality, then the spiritual work is done. Then there's no more work to be done. One great gift that we can give to others is forgiveness. I remember once being in the office, her office uh, with Sri Dayamada. This was in her later years as SRF president. I think many of you know she was president of self-realization for over 50 years and such a wonderful, wonderful example for all of us. Well, this particular day, she told me of a rather difficult experience she had in her early years as SRF president. There had been a, a monk here who had helped Master in different ways. And after Master left this world and entered Maha Samadhi, this monk left the ashram and married. And for a time, he caused quite a bit of trouble for Sri Dayamada and the SRF Board of Directors. Well, some years after that, Ma told me, he came to Mount Washington and he asked to see her. And of course, she agreed. He had been diagnosed with a terminal illness. And the doctors had told him that he had only months to live. And at that point, as I understand it, he was still relatively young. And he was really broken in spirit. And he was crying and sobbing before her. And he said, Ma, do you think that Master will ever forgive me for what I did to his work? And Ma told him, I know Master forgives you. And when she related that, those words to me, there was such a power 
a, a vibration of forgiveness and compassion and love. I know Master forgives you. And then as he was about to leave, she said to him, would you like to meditate in Master's shrine before you go? And she said those words with such tenderness, such caring gentleness. It was almost like a mother speaking to her cherished, beloved child. What I saw that day, the great love of God, the great forgiveness of God expressing through one of his great saints, it was something I've always remembered. In the Mahabharata of India, it says, one should forgive under any injury. Forgiveness is holiness. Forgiveness and gentleness are the qualities of the self-possessed. They represent eternal virtue. So when you're having your introspection at the end of the day, a very good question to ask, is there anybody I need to forgive? And that brings us to our next affirmation. So let us close our eyes, and put our attention at the heart center, and please repeat with me. Today I forgive all those who have ever offended me. I give my love to all thirsty hearts, both to those who love me and to those who do not love me. Today I forgive all those who have ever offended me. Today I forgive all those who have ever offended me. I give my love to all thirsty hearts. There's one final point I want to make, and then we'll conclude the talk and we'll have a period of meditation together. But as devotees of God, we have a certain responsibility to the world. What do we give to the world? We give peace to the world. And how do we give peace? to the world. We give peace by our meditations, by prayer, by spiritualizing our lives. And I know you may think, well, that's easy to say. <laughs> but you look at the world and it's a mess. And what can I, one person, one devotee do? How can I possibly make a difference? Well, here's what Master would say to you, and this is something he said many times, repeatedly. One moon gives more light than all the stars. Meaning, one mooned soul who deeply seeks God, who meditates faithfully, who gives love and kindness to others, who tries to live a virtuous life. One devotee like that indeed makes a difference. And when you have many uniting in meditation, uniting in prayer, uniting in their sincere utmost efforts to follow the teachings of our guru, that creates a collective vibration of goodness that is very powerful, that definitely 
has an elevating influence on the world. Paramahansaji said, one who in every way tries to uplift himself, harmonizing body, mind, and soul with the divine, creates positive karma not only in his own life, but in his family, neighborhood, country, and world. If you have a large room and it's pitch black, but if you go to the corner and there's a little lamp and you turn on that little lamp, that little lamp can illuminate the entire room to some degree. One lamp can do it. Guruji said, don't think the contribution made by your spiritualized consciousness is small. Your part may mean very much. So in that spirit, we do what we can. Doesn't matter what world is going through, we do what we can. And we do make a difference. And I'm going to conclude our talk with these words of Guruji where he's giving us our marching orders. And I hope and pray that you will remember these words because they're very powerful. And these are our marching orders for this difficult world. Here's what he says. Follow these immortal teachings for in every way this work of self-realization fellowship is helping mankind. We are soldiers of God who have come with the power of love, the power of wisdom, and the power of spirituality to spread the fire of spirit that burns all darkness from human life. So now we'll be having our uh, meditation together. So Assume proper meditation posture, shoulders back, chest out, abdomen comfortably in, feet flat on the floor, spine nice and erect, but assuming a good meditation posture, then consciously relax and the shoulders may come forward a little bit and that's okay. You don't want to be straining or tensing in any way. Lifting the gaze to the point between the eyebrows and consciously feel that as you lift the gaze, it's like turning a switch and you're turning off this outer material world. And now you are in that inner sanctuary of spirit, the source of ever new joy, boundless love, infinite wisdom and peace. This is our true home. This is the source of all our strength, all our happiness, all our creativity. In that interior sanctuary, now to withdraw the energy more from the body, let us a few times Inhale, tensing the body a little bit, and then holding briefly, and then exhale and relax. And just do that several times, and each time you relax, feel you're pulling the energy more and more away from the body, away from the outer world.
now. Just be aware of the natural flow of the breath. Don't try to slow it down or control it in any way. Just observe it like you're an impartial observer, separated from it. And feel with each breath you're sinking into a state of deeper relaxation and concentration and peace. Deeper, deeper, deeper into the peace and stillness of the soul. Now, in that sanctuary within, keeping your gaze at the point between the eyebrows, let us listen to these words of Guruji as he led the devotees into a prayer and meditation for world peace. Guruji says, close your eyes and concentrate deeply at the center of divine consciousness between the eyebrows. Feel the infinite love of God within your heart. Let your heart emanate that love for all the world. So let us do that now, feel in that tremendous wave of love flowing from our hearts to the whole world. Guruji goes on, feel that your love is going forth like an invisible x-ray coursing through space into the hearts of the dictators and prime ministers and heads of all nations that they may bring peace and international prosperity on earth instead of destruction. So sending our love to all the leaders of all nations on this earth, harmonizing them with love and peace, divine harmony.
Guruji continues, include in the powerful radiation of your love all peoples of the world. And then Guruji prays, and we can mentally follow along. May our united healing rays of love be surcharged by the infinite love of our Father and bathe the entire earth, permeating the hearts of all leaders and citizens of the world, that they may be filled with the universal amity and harmony of spirit, bringing peace on earth, goodwill toward all, under the fatherhood of God. Peace on earth, goodwill toward all, under the fatherhood of God. He continues, Heavenly Father, bless the nations of the earth, our own large family, that all may realize their eternal kinship as thy children. Thou art our one spiritual father, the beloved of the universe and the beloved of our hearts. Bless them all. Bless all citizens of the earth that they may establish a cooperative unity among all souls and live in a united world with thy power and light of love guiding us to thy kingdom. Thy power and light of love guiding us to thy kingdom. Peace. Amen. And you see, when we come together for meditation like this, you see what a difference it can make. We are not helpless. And so, yes, it is a difficult world we live in, but perhaps we've incarnated at this particular time 
because God and Guru needs us here to help the world, in addition to helping ourselves, of course, but to help the world, to contribute, to helping the world move into a higher age. So don't let the world troubles daunt you in any way. And I'm going to close with, I'd like to read again what I think of as Master's marching orders for us. And so this is the final thought I'm going to leave us with today. We are soldiers of God who have come with the power of love, the power of wisdom, and the power of spirituality to spread the fire of spirit that burns all darkness from human life. So again, it's a deep joy to have joined with you and enjoyed, uh, enjoyed satsang with you in this class, uh, wishing you a wonderful, blessed convocation for the rest of the week. May God and the Great Ones bless us all.